Hey there, my name is Ursula. Welcome to my channel. I'm starting a series called Deadly Women Around the World, which is a true crime series. And our first stop on the Deadly Women World Tour, if I can call it that, is going to be in Puerto Rico, where we will discover the story of Lidia Echevarria. Disclaimer, this video contains sensitive topics. Viewer discretion advised. The people involved were TV show hosts, actors, very prominent in the Puerto Rican media scene, shall I call it. Let's get a little background on their stories. Lidia Echevarria was born in Puerto Rico in a family with two siblings and she showed talent at a very young age in the form of poetry recitals for her school. She, like many others, had her obstacles along the way with her parents' divorce and her having to move with her mom to a neighborhood with no running water nor electricity. It didn't stop her from obtaining the main roles in plays in her school. She excelled in her studies. She graduated before she met her first husband, with whom she had her first son. She kept acting. One thing led to another, and she soon began acting in telenovelas, which are soap operas. And she was acting alongside the biggest stars in Puerto Rico at that time. So she was getting quite famous. Echevarria met Luis Vigoro in 1960 as he was producing. What was that accent? <laughs> as he was producing and co hosting a show called La Hora Cero with her, meaning the hour zero or midnight. He was born in April 1928 in Puerto Rico as well. He was one of eight children in a modest family. His father died when he was very young and he was raised by his mother. In his teenage years, he found work in a radio station. As it was the beginning of World War II, it was easier for him to get hired because most of the people that were previously working at the radio were sent to war. So he got a job there and started exploring various areas of entertainment and show business as a show host, a presenter, a commentator, amongst other roles. He went on to become a pioneer in Puerto Rican television and a very well-known and acclaimed host, comedian, and producer. He married his first wife and had three sons. He was still married to his first wife when he met Lydia, who was herself still married to her first husband. So they basically had an affair and uh, she was willing to divorce her husband relatively fast to be able to get into this relationship and marry Luis Vigoro. He was a little bit more reluctant and he, he was kind of forced to divorce because his wife found out about the affair and she was like, I'm not having it. So, okay, it's over. That's when... Him and Lydia got married. They had two daughters of their own, Glenda Lee and Vanessa. The couple started working together and encountered numerous successes in the entertainment business in Puerto Rico and abroad. In mid-1973, that's when Nidia Castillo, not Lydia, Nidia, started working with the couple on their show. She was a young model, beautiful, and she soon gained their trust. She would sometimes spend the night at their house, in fact. It was said that Lydia was a jealous woman. However, she seemed to take a liking to this Nidia woman, and uh, everything was fine and dandy until fast forward three years from then, and Louis is allegedly having an affair with Nidia Castillo. In fact, he's planning to divorce Lydia to marry Nidia. I know. The names are confusing here. <laughs> According to Nidia, Lydia treated her marriage like a money-making machine and Luis was very unhappy. Lydia, being the jealous woman we know her to be, is, uh, is not having it. Yeah, she finds out. In 1981, Lydia and Luis separate. From then on would occur a series of events that would definitely uh, cast a shadow on their image of the perfect couple. I think I understood that Lydia was accusing Luis of having tried to run her over with his car. 
are, I'm not quite sure there. It's kind of confusing what happened at this time. Rumor has it that on one occasion, Lydia pointed a gun at Luis and told him that she would rather see him dead than married to Nidia. Nidia confirmed that Luis had told her that and the police later found a gun in her possession that fit the description that Nidia had given them. So that's that. But they were never able to find out how she got the gun. Now that the background has been established... Let's move on to the crime. On the 17th of January of 1983, Luis did not show up for work and his worried co-workers called the police. A search was launched. The body of Luis Vigoro was identified as being the one found in the trunk of his Mercedes. He had been kidnapped as he was leaving a meeting with Lydia and her lawyer and his lawyer to finalize the divorce. So these two guys, they kidnap him and they take him to a remote area outside of San Juan. Then they stab him multiple times with an ice pick, apparently, and they stuff him in the trunk of his own car, bludgeon him with a tire iron. Then, while he is still alive, set fire to the car. The media was all over it. In 1984, Lydia was arrested along with three other men that she allegedly had commissioned to murder her husband and convicted of first-degree murder, conspiracy, and abduction. But the case crumbled. Witnesses revealed that they had lied during the trial. So everyone was exonerated and we were back to square one. The trial was a circus. Lydia's housekeeper came forward and said that a man introducing himself as David came to the door of Lydia's house one day and he went in to see Lydia, talked with her discreetly for about 15 to 20 minutes and then went on his way with an envelope. The investigation was reopened. Another witness came forward and talked to the police about a conversation he had had with Papo Newman, who told him a few weeks prior to the murder about the contract and about how Lydia actually not only wanted Louise dead, but she also allegedly, of course, wanted Nidia dead as well. And that's when they ended up finding Francisco Papo Newman, who they made this deal with, and he testified against everyone else in exchange for immunity. Totally ludicrous. They revealed that Lydia Echevarria was the one that paid them supposedly $2,500 each for the murder of her husband. Papa was to find another person to help him fulfill the contract. It took him about six months to find David Lopez Watts, known as El Dominicano. According to Papo, she would have told them where he was going to be because she was having this meeting with him and the lawyer. Lydia even gave him a key to Luis's car. At an intersection, Papo was able to make his way into the passenger seat of Luis's car, then forcing him to drive 15 minutes away all the way to Los Guanos. And that's where they forced him out of the car and started attacking him. So poor Luis was left to die a horrible death. It was revealed that he was still alive when the car was burning because they found traces of charcoal and ashes in his lungs. It was only a little bit later that the car was discovered. So Lydia was charged as before and after a long deliberation the jury found her guilty by nine votes to three. In July of 1986, Lydia Echevarria was convicted. She was convicted of first-degree murder and kidnapping. She was sentenced to 208 years in prison. In court, Vanessa, her youngest daughter, said, Lo que comenzó como un teatro tenía que terminar igual, which means what started as a show had to finish the same way, um, referring probably to the circus aspect of this whole trial. Maybe also the verdict. 
I mean, 208 years in prison. They could have said like two life sentences or just life sentence. You know, in 1991, Lydia's appeal stated that Papa Newman was not a credible source and that his evidence should not have been taken into account in the trial. And since his evidence was the basis of the prosecution's case, you know, without it, they would have had little evidence of her involvement in all of this. This leaves me wondering, who really knows in the end? She ends up being indulted. I had to look this up. Indulted means pardoned. In January of 2000. So roughly 13 and a half or 13 years after having been convicted. So from 208 years, which was the original sentence, she gets off with 13. 13 years. Although to this day she claims her innocence... It was, quote-unquote, her declining health, which warranted her release. Mm -hmm. She's now able to live her life practically normally, with the exception of the 8 p.m. curfew. Yes, this was the condition of her release. She had to be home by 8 p.m. every day. Why? I don't know. Weird. I don't know. I mean, what could she do past 8 p.m. that she could not do before 8 p.m.? I mean, given that supposedly, allegedly, she hired people to do her deed for her. So what is the point of an 8 p.m. curfew? Okay, well, that affected her life in the sense that she could not give evening representations at the theater. She had to do matinees. Oh, how sad. So, of course, when that happened, the people were outraged. It was quite divided. It was quite um, controversial. A lot of people were really insulted by the fact that she would get off so easily and so fast. And, yeah, her friends and her fans were, were happy. But get this, in 2001, merely one year after having been released, after her pardon... She makes her comeback with a role in a show called Confinadas, which means imprisoned. She plays the role of Maggie, a woman who is sentenced to 99 years in prison for having killed her husband. Anyway, the media did not take too well to that. The public opinion was torn. Some people were some people were highlighting the fact that the justice system was not the same for people with wealth and fame and people who had none of these things. The person that was responsible for her release had previously stated that he would never show mercy to someone who had offended uh, in such a grave manner. And he ended up doing it for her, um, supposedly because of her health. But really, when she started acting again, she once said to journalists that besides her knees that were bothering her a little bit, she felt just fine. In fact, she would, after her shows, she would go off the stage dancing. She, she seemed to be doing just fine. And that is also why people felt like they had been slapped in the face. So yes, she had an 8 p.m. curfew. And that bothered her because she wanted to go on evening representation. She went as far as to appeal to the Puerto Rican Parole Board to ask that her curfew, well, she wanted it pushed back to 1 a.m., but she was denied. So that's that's that. And what happened to the, the two men that she hired to do the dirty work, you may ask? Well, one of them... Since he testified against her and helped the police with the case, he had no jail time, just no jail time, none whatsoever. That's how that went down. The other one, uh, just like Lydia, uh, served about 13 years in jail. So, yeah. Did her career recover, you wonder? Well, it did. And she has been very active for someone whose declining health warranted her getting out of jail. In July 2008, her eldest daughter, Glendali, 
was found dead by her husband as he came back home. She had a gun wound to her head and forensics later confirmed that it was self-inflicted. So it was ruled as a suicide. Nobody really knows why she did it. Was it linked to her father's murder? To her mother? We may never know. Maybe was it something completely unrelated? So, I don't know if this is true or just a rumor, but Glenda Lee's lawyer thinks it's suspicious that Paul, her new husband, convinced her to get a million dollar life insurance policy to which he was the only beneficiary months before her death. Also, by the time her sister arrived after she died, Paul had removed all of her belongings from the house as though she had never existed. I feel all sorts of weird about this story, honestly. You know, on the, on the one hand, there's this little old lady, a cute little old grandma, looks sweet as any old grandma would. On the other hand, there's these two shady men that could have very well orchestrated all this for monetary gain. Who knows? Um, there seemed to have been evidence against Lydia for her to have been convicted in the first place. But in the middle of all this, this justice system seems to not be very decided on what the heck they choose to do with her, you know? First, they sentence her to two th I was going to say 2000. First, they sentenced her to 208 years in jail. Then they just let her go free after 13. I mean, which is it? Is she guilty or is she not guilty? <sighs> I'm just confused. Let me know your thoughts down below. Let's have a conversation. And if you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Maybe subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any further uploads. I will be making all sorts of what the F stories, sometimes of a mysterious nature, sometimes of a historical nature, sometimes artsy stuff that I'm going to be sliding in there for the purpose of cleansing the mind and soul. And we'll see how it goes. Anyways, I hope you have a good day wherever you are. And that's all for now. Bye.